to this Dean seminar. As you know, we've been um, conducting a series of seminars on the theme of diversity, equity, and inclusion in public health. And uh, I need to uh, give very special thanks uh, to Tamia Belmore, who has been working uh, with us to organize these and is online with me right now, helping me to, to co-host this, as well as Natasha Kazin, who is the chair of our diversity and inclusion um, committee. But I have a very special welcome to Ben Smith. Ben Smith is uh, the, um, the manager of the, um, the, the US Indian Health Service. Uh, this is a very uh, unique opportunity for us to learn from somebody who is, um, my understanding, um, a, a member of the Navajo Indian tribe. He is also uh, a leader in health and health care um, in Indian country in the United States. And he's also, I can tell you from having spoken with him, a superb healthcare manager. And so I know that his areas of expertise hit on a number of interests by a number of members of our School of Public Health community. So without any further ado, I welcome um, you, um, Ben Smith, uh, to our forum. Hi, how are you? Hi, very good. Thank you, uh, Dean Goldman. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And certainly for me, um, being an alum of uh, George Washington University, I received my master's in business administration there. Um, it's great to be back on campus, even virtually. And certainly now to share what I'm doing in my professional capacity as a, a federal uh, employee of the Indian Health Service, which is an agency in the Department of Health and Human Services. As was mentioned, I am a member of the Navajo Nation, and I would like to start off by introducing myself as we do in Navajo, or as we call ourselves, Dene, the people. Ben Smith, Yanishne, Shia Bilagana, Nishli Dokini, Kia Ani Bashashin, Bilagani Dashishche, Lutsina Jini Dashaneli, Ahia. What I did right now was I introduced in Navajo how we would greet ourselves in introducing our, our clans. We're a, a matriarchal um, uh, society. So we start by introducing our maternal um, lineage through clans. And since my, um, my birth mother is non-native, um, I, I say Biligana, she's of European descent. But for my father's clan, my maternal, um, I, I'm born for the Towering House um, clan, which is my father's mother. And then subsequently we'll introduce our uh, paternal uh, clans as well. So again, my mother's father is non-native, but my father's family is, and from the clan of Sinajini, which is the Black Streak Woods people. And this is a great way to introduce ourselves because one, it gives us a sense of understanding of our relationship among one another. And um, I'll be honest with you, it certainly helped out um, in the dating scene as I was growing up, knowing who you're related to and having that instant understanding. I want to go ahead and um, start to share my screen. Today, what I want to provide is one, an overview of the Indian Health Service and our government to government relationship that exists with American Indian and Alaska Native uh, tribes across the country. It's had its own history, and um, there's a lot to speak to in how we've uh, arrived where we are today in terms of federal policy that plays into the, some, into the decision making and financial decisions across the country. So with that, I am going to uh, share my screen. And I just want to do a check. If you're able to see it, can you give me a thumbs up? Oh, very good. Excellent. So starting with the Indian Health Service, just to give you a snapshot of where we're at today, we are a federal agency within the Department of Health and Human Services and provide comprehensive healthcare services to approximately 2.6 million American Indians, Alaska Natives across the country. Uh, these individuals are members of 574 federally recognized tribes. Uh, growing up in, um, in rural Utah, Southern Utah and Northern Arizona, 
I felt that the Navajo Nation was the only federally recognized tribe. So I learned a lot in, in, um, in um, understanding the national perspective that each tribe is distinct with its own culture and background, language and customs. And to see that we have 574 of these across the country today is outstanding. Uh, this does not account for um, state recognized tribes. If you recall a couple years back, uh, we had a number of tribes in the Commonwealth of Virginia who received federal recognition. And to this day, a number of tribes are working either through Congress or through the Department of Interior for federal recognition. Our budget is approximately, as you can see, $6 billion. In comparison, if you see that across uh, other federal programs that provide direct healthcare services, such as Department of Defense, uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons, or um, um, the Veterans Administration, uh, our standing is not in the high rankings, I'll, I'll be honest. And we'll talk about some of the challenges down the road of what um, money does in terms of uh, success for, for healthcare. Our staff is dedicated to our mission, which is to raise the physical, mental, social, and spiritual health of American Indians and Alaska Natives to the highest level. We have a little over 15,000 employees, and you can see the different uh, provider types that play out. In addition to the clinicians that you see here, we have a strong workforce of, of architects, environmental engineers, uh, lawyers, administrators, and I point this out only to show that in healthcare, everybody can play a role. There's the health and the human side, human services side of what we do. So how did we get to where we're at today? On this slide, you'll see a number of uh, documents. There's a lot of laws that have been enacted over the past 200 years, but I'd like to start back by going directly to uh, the U.S. Constitution, because it's within the U.S. Constitution where we identify and highlight the um, government-to-government -government relationship that exists between the U United States government and Indian tribes that occurred through treaty makings. For those of you who have had the opportunity to visit the uh, Smithsonian Museum of the National Indian, they have an outstanding um, exhibit on, on treaties that really walks you through of history in a nutshell, with one, the US government making promises through treaties, two, federal policy where uh, some of the promises may have been broken, and three, to the current um, realm where we find, or policy realm where we fall, find ourselves, which is a, that of self-determination. And it's with that, that you see on the slide, the congressional policy in our time that was enacted in, in the mid, mid 1970s, that it's the policy of this nation in fulfillment of its special trust responsibilities and legal obligations to Indians to ensure the highest possible health status for Indians and urban Indians and to provide all resources necessary to affect that policy. Um, if you go into the statute itself, it delineates some of the responsibilities. Not only does it uh, relate to healthcare, but it, addresses um, um, how, how, to, uh, how to direct attention to uh, health disparities, um, education, scholarships of healthcare providers, and even government to government relationships on how we communicate. This is important and I point this out because earlier this year, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services were excited to uh, roll out our Healthy People 2030 objectives at George Washington University, as we did um, similar to the Healthy People 2020 objectives. And what you find specifically in the congressional policy on Indian health is that the healthcare objective standard are directly linked to those Healthy People objectives. So you can imagine across the country, um, American Native, Alaska Native uh, health policy workers as well as clinicians, they're looking forward to those standards and more so how those relate to the settings or environments which they find themselves. Um, within our system, there's been often um, a challenge of conflating 
Indian, our Indian health system with rural health. And while many of the tribes across the country are located in rural settings, a large population, almost 70% of American Indians and Alaska Natives reside, reside in urban areas. So you can imagine what that means in terms of bringing data to the picture. On the bottom of the slide, I do want to point to some of the historical transitions that have occurred. Starting back in the early 1800s, the administration of Indian Affairs was based in the Department of War, which is where Indian health or the services that existed at that time really resided. The provision of federal health services to Indian was part of the US Army's responsibility to control the spread of infectious diseases and in particular to protect soldiers and other non-Indians living nearby. This could be occurring in military forts where episodic care such as um, military, that military physicians would offer such as um, you know, smallpox and, um, um, or other preventative care uh, would, would take place. It wasn't until 1832 that Congress first appropriated funds for healthcare of Indian people specifically for uh, purchasing small quantities of the small pack, smallpox vaccine to immunize uh, the Indians. As you can see below, and I forgot to put this in there, but there's an important um, logo that should be in there, and that's the Department of the Interior. Um, in 1849, the Indian Medical Services transferred from military control and oversight to civilian control when the newly created Department of the Interior uh, occurred that year. And throughout the years within the Department of the Interior, there were several um, milestones that occurred, such as at the turn of the century in 1908, the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, began to develop healthcare services for American Indians in the last, well, American Indians at the time and by 1910, Congress had began appropriations for healthcare services administered by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. But what's, out, what's of note is the first separate funding for Indian health, which was in the amount of $40,000, was identified in the Appropriation Act of 1911. When you think about that in terms of today's currency, that dollar value is right around a million dollars. Think about the population and what you can do with, with that pot of funds. Our key piece of legislation, which you see on here, some will um, point it as our enabling act is the Snyder Act, which was enacted in 1921. And this authorized funding for federal Indian health programs for the relief of distress, conservation of health and employment of physicians for Indian tribes as well as directing the Bureau of Indian Affairs to administer programs for the benefit, care, and assistance for the Indians through the United States. Even today, we still point to that act as one of our uh, key cornerstone um, pieces of legislation in working with Congress to appropriate uh, uh, funding to carry out some of the statutory authorities that we have. Over the years, a huge transition occurred leading up to the 60s. Before I, I talk a little bit about this initial support for self-determination and self-governance, which is the current paradigm uh, shift of health policy we find ourselves in, I wanna highlight a couple important steps that occurred throughout the way. Um, starting back in the, in the 1950s. So in 1954, Indian advocacy organizations and public officials felt that healthcare could be better served by the United States Public Health Service under the Department of Health, Education and Welfare, which we all know today as the Department of Health and Human Services. And so the, in that same year, Congress enacted the Transfer Act to move the responsibility for Indian healthcare to health, education and welfare. And the following year in, 90, in 1955, the Indian Health Service became an agency within the United States Public Health Service. Through that transfer, about 2,500 health program personnel of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, along with 48 hospitals, 18 health centers, 62 health stations, and 13 school infirmaries, 
and other locations came under the jurisdiction of the newly created Indian Health Service. The committee's appropriations of the House of Representatives in, their 84th, in the 84th Congress directed the US Public Health Service to make a comprehensive survey of Indian health. The United States Public Health Service established a survey team and over the next year, this team conducted extensive survey of Indian health, including in-depth studies of nine reservations. The results were transmitted to Congress in 1957 as Health Services for American Indians. This report had a gold cover and it became commonly known as the 1957 IHS Gold Book. What's interesting in the conclusions from this report is that it found one, a substantial federal Indian health program will be required. Two, all community health resources should be developed in cooperation with Indian communities and done on a reservation by reservation basis. Three, federal Indian health programs should be planned in each community and services made available to Indians under state and local programs. And finally, efforts should be made to recognize the obligations and responsibilities to Indian residents on a non-discriminatory basis from state and local communities. Now, if you think back to what was going on uh, during this period, while well, these studies are, being, are, are taking place, the United States policy at that time was one of um, termination. It was actually uh, seeking to assimilate American Indians and Alaska Natives into to mainstream um, America. And part of my family, including my father, who uh, is, is full um, Navajo and went through the boarding school process, he still shares with me today some of the experiences of learning English as a second language and ultimately making it through uh, the education process where he is a physician and um, uh, joined uh, the Indian Health Service has since retired and has returned to his people on the Navajo Reservation, uh, serving in a community health center. Um, however, while that side of the story may sound okay, uh, there's a lot of trauma that um, was imposed on him or that he experienced uh, through that experience. And for myself, not having gone through it, when I hear about these, it instills a little bit of trauma in myself, which was unexpected. And um, and uh, something I needed to manage. And uh, this really brings in an important point, which I don't think is only inherent to the American Indian Alaska Native experience, but also inherent to others who have either gone through colonization or significant changes where this uh, trauma from historical events may be passed down generation to generation. And so uh, closing out that decade, uh, two additional things occurred of note. One, bringing in the environmental side. So in 1959, with the enactment of the Sanitation Facilities Act, this enabled the Indian Health Service to uh, become, an, for, for sanitation, such as uh, water uh, sanitation, facility construction, to become an integral part of the National Indian Health Service Public Health Program. And finally, at the as we go into this next decade, an important provider type um, came forward, which we know today as community health representatives. This started out from a training center in Tucson, Arizona, which brought in um, American and Alaska natives uh, from the communities uh, who needed uh, training to help bridge the existing gap between patients in the communities who needed care and health clinics and hospitals that provided it. And in 1968, the, the Community Health Representative Program became the first formal assumption by an Indian tribe of an IHS supported program and still continues to carry out important work today. Um, certainly in, in light of um, our current uh, pandemic where social distancing is important, uh, these, these um, frontline um, community uh, representatives play an important role in helping to bridge uh, the gaps where needed. So as we find ourselves right now on this slide, American presidents in the 20th century rarely met with lead Indian leaders to discuss tribal issues. However, in the late 1960s, federal policies shift shifted to support tribal self-determination first discussed by President Johnson, 
announced by President Nixon and signed into law by President Ford, every president in Congress has since supported self-determination policy and welcome changed. And, and this is based off of some of the findings of, of that gold, gold book report that helped in, influence uh, Congress. In 1968, in his special message to Congress, President Johnson stated, I propose a new goal for our Indian programs, a goal that ends the old debate about determination of Indian programs and stresses self-determination, a goal that erases old attitudes of paternalism and promotes partnerships, self-help. Our goal must be a standard of living for the Indians equal to that of the country as a whole. I propose in short, a policy of maximum choice for the American Indian, a policy expressed in programs of self-help, self-development, self-determination. President Nixon in his 1970 special address to Congress noted that the Indian community is almost entirely run by outsiders who are responsible and responsive to federal officials in Washington, DC, rather than to the communities they are supposed to be serving. Of the Department of Interior's programs directly serving Indians, for example, only 1.5% are presently under Indian control. Only 2.4% of the Indian health programs are run by Indians. We must begin to act on the basis of what the Indians themselves have long been telling us. The time has come to break decisively with the past and to create conditions for a new era in which the Indian future is determined by Indian acts and Indian decisions. And I love this quote, self-determination without termination, where local uh, tribes are beginning to have a voice into the types of services uh, that, that they carry out and need on their um, lands that are culturally appropriate. So in 1975, another landmark legislation was enacted, the Indian Self-Determination Education Assistance Act. This act um, did a couple of things, but most importantly, it introduced a new form of contracting for um, Indian Health Service and the Department of the Interior that allows tribes to assume program service functions or activities that were previously or previously carried out uh, by the federal government. And it allows them the decision-making process to tailor those programs to meet the local needs of their community. Going back to some of the opening comments of 574 federally recognized tribes in um, 30, 30, um, over 35 states, the needs of one tribe in Alaska is not going to be the same needs of a tribe in the state of Maine. Likewise, even in the same state, um, for example, the Havasupai that reside at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, their needs may not be the same as those of, of my tribe, the Navajo Nation in northern Arizona, uh, just due to the, the different factors. But through this, um, this law, what we'll see as we go through the decades, even to present, at the Indian Health Service, tribes have now exercised this authority to assume programs, um, large and small, uh, to the tune of over 60% of the IHS appropriated budget. So that is phenomenal in thinking about the major strides we have taken in terms of government to government relations, working in partnership with tribes, learning on some of the best practices and certainly sharing um, our experience here at the Indian Health Service. In 1976, we also saw a new federal focus on healthcare of American Indians, Alaska Natives. In the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act, Congress found that the health status of Indians ranked far below that of the general population. Today, this act is considered to be the cornerstone legal authority for the provision of healthcare to American Indians, Alaska Natives. It has undergone considerable tribal consultation and was reauthorized four times before it was permanently reauthorized in spring of 2010. And while IHS receives most of its, well, basically all of its authorities from the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act, there's a number of provisions within this act that um, we have not yet to date received appropriations to implement. So for, to give you an example, uh, there's a provision for men's health programs um, IHS has never formally received appropriations to set up um, men's health programs. 
Um, and we're hopeful to, to work with Congress uh, down the road. But for those tribal health programs, meaning those tribes that are exercising um, self-determination or self-governance under the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act, uh, they have the ability to um, redesign or rebudget uh, their, their, their funds that they receive from the Indian Health Service uh, to expand programs. So we are aware of, ver of a number of instances across the country where tribal health programs have either rebudgeted the federal resources they receive from Indian Health Service, or they have supplemented with their tribal um, resources, which the federal government cannot do, to, to implement some of these uh, additional authorities of the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act. Uh, one area in particular is a, a, along the lines of long-term services and support for both the elderly and disabled in, um, in tribal communities. So what is tribal consultation? As, as uh, the new policy era of self-determination open, uh, voice and, and meaningful conversation became an important point. And one item that has stemmed from that is tribal consultation. This is a new focus that, I, that the IHS director, uh, or former director Michael Trujillo stated that we are beginning to focus in these meetings more on the healthcare initiatives and concerns of improving the programs within the communities. We're looking at other issues which will strengthen the focus of healthcare initiatives and how we can, can collaborate. It means we're now having open and honest conversations with tribal leaders on a government to government basis. In 1997, um, HHS policy on consultation with tribal governance governments was, um, was published. In that same year, the Indian Health Service developed its, its uh, first tribal consultation policy. This form of co communications, uh, which emphasizes trust, respect, and shared responsibility has been underscored by um, administrations as well. In response in particular to President Clinton's executive memorandum, the Indian Health Service established and re revised its tribal consultation and participation policy. Two additional re revisions have occurred in um, 2001 and 2006, and we're currently working in line with the Department of Health and Human Services to further um, make improvements to the way that we communicate through tribal consultation. Tribal consultation is triggered typically by a critical event that could be identified by the federal government or by a, a tribal, um, a tribe itself. So some that are um, pretty, pretty standard that occur are when there's a change in law. So say for example, Congress um, appropriates additional funding to the Indian Health Service for a special initiative or to implement an additional um, provision of the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act that would, that would be considered a critical event. And Indian Health Service would notify tribes of the change. And then one, start seeking input on, in, on recommendations on how to implement that. Knowing that there's 574 federally recognized tribes that we have the exact same relationship with, sometimes small pots of money are a little challenging in terms of asking for an equitable distribution uh, and trying to make adjustments for um, population of a tribe, uh, their social economic status, some of the geographical um, isolation factors that may play in. But in some, over the past uh, uh, three decades, since we've been institu instituting a tribal consultation policy, we are proud of the, the steps we've made in terms of progress moving forward of how we communicate and certainly understanding the expectations of tribes through this process. As I mentioned before, the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act was permanently reauthorized in 2010 uh, through the enactment of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Uh, what this did is one, it permanently um, authorized Indian Health Service as a, as a public health authority. Um, it brings in key updates to a number of provisions, whether it's related to um, our scholarship program, our construction programs, uh, direct clinical care, um, you name it. 
or even um, partnerships with other federal agencies, including the, the Veterans Administration and the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. In line with um, tribal consultation and ensure, ensuring that it's meaningful, um, in 2010, that same year, the Department of Health and Human Services stood up what is known as the Secretary's Tribal Advisory um, Council or, or STAC. And what this council does is bring together um, uh, members who represent the tribes within the 12 IHS regions across the country to discuss and make recommendations to the Secretary of the Health and Human Services, whether they're, they're health priorities or uh, funding priorities. One thing the Indian Health Sur and Indian Self-Determination Education Assistance Act brought as a requirement is to consult annually and solicit the participation of tribal uh, leaders in the development and formulation of the IHS budget. So we do that on an annual basis. Of course, there's deliberations that occur on the federal side and consultation does not um, waive, waive that delivery process pr privilege. But what it does do, it helps to bring in those local um, individual tribal specific issues to the forefront of uh, policy, um, policy leaders at the Department of Health and Human Services uh, to shape and plan for the future. Also in 2013, uh, we, we had the stand up of the formation of the White House Council of Na on Native American Affairs. Now this council is comprised of cabinet level executives in government who come and discuss American Indian Alaska Native issues uh, collectively. Um, there was a period where it was not as actively engaged. Um, earlier this year, the Trump administration um, issued an executive order uh, to get uh, work within this council um, uh, revitalized. And um, one thing we do find in government, certainly at the Indian Health Service, is that working within our bounds is a little challenging. Um, certainly in times uh, of addressing um, issues that may have uh, Department of Justice considerations. Um, to give you an example is the missing murdered in indigenous um, peoples um, work that's happening across the country trying to address human trafficking and uh, working within our lanes but collectively with all the federal resources. And as you can imagine for a tribal government trying to navigate that can be quite complicated. So we're very appreciative to the work of, of this council as they move uh, things forward. So I've talked a lot about history, but you know there are significant challenges that present themselves um, at in the in the work that we do, and um, you know whether it pertains to recruitment or retention of um, of healthcare pro professionals in rural settings or you know, the competitive factor of other uh, federal agencies to, for an individual who wants to choose Indian Health Service versus um, a similar career with the Veterans Affairs. Um, our authorities don't necessarily align all the time. So there may be a little bit of um, difference in some pay scales or certain authorities that exist. And so we're, we're really trying to work on the policy fr front and with Congress to make them aware of, of these discrepancies uh, just on the federal, um, in the federal house itself. But to, to build awareness that there is this type of need in our country here today. Myself, I personally experienced this as I was geared up and set up for a a career in um, international development. And it wasn't until my father came to me and asked me to look into a fellowship at Indian Health Service. Um, I, I always say he tricked me because I, I did it and I fell in love with the work that I do here. And uh, seeing that, you know, some of the, the circumstances that I experienced in West Africa are very similar to, to some in um, Alaska or um, even in my home state of Southern Utah and Northern Arizona of access to water. So there are a number of opportunities as, as we um, move forward, but in addressing the health disparities, um, barriers such as uh, funding, um, access to um, 
And so resources uh, continues to be a challenge. I do wanna to point to the geographical locations. As you can see on this map, this outlines the 12 areas um, and uh, where facilities are located. Um, some of them are in rural settings, some of them are in urban settings, and some may be small, some may be, be, may be big. As I wrap up my presentation, I do want to focus a little bit on the United States Public Health Service. For more than 200 years, men and women have served on the front lines of the nation's public health in what's today, what is today called the Commission Corps of the United States Public Health Service. The Commission Corps is one of the eight uniformed services in the United States and traces its beginning back to the U United States Marine Hospital Service, protecting against the spread of disease from sailors returning from foreign ports and maintaining the health of immigrants entering the country. In 1926, commissioned officers began, of the United States Public Health Service began to be assigned directly to Indian health programs. During that period, that responsibility for Indian health remained at the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And uh, as, as we went through the, the timeline, uh, we saw how that was transferred over to um, Indian Health Service in, in 1955. But currently, commissioned Corps officers are involved in healthcare delivery to understand to the underserved and vulnerable populations, disease control and prevention, biomedical research, food and drug regulation, mental health and drug abuse services, and response efforts for national and man-made disasters as an, as an essential component of the largest public health program in the world. Today, Commission Corps continues to fulfill its mission to protect, promote, and advance the health and safety of the nation. They are on the front lines of the battle against Zika and Ebola and are called upon disasters like the Flint, Michigan water crisis, or when hurricanes strike the mainland and now certainly with the coronavirus pandemic. At the Indian Health Service, we employ more commission officers than any other agency in federal government with over 1,600 officers or 27% of the total commission core force strength. Our officers feel a great sense of pride serving those in great need in culturally rich communities. What sets IHS apart is living and working with the communities we serve. Officers often participate in cultural and community activities and become a part of the communities they serve. I, as, as November, we celebrate American Indian Alaska Native heritage, but we also celebrate veterans. And in my family, I'm extremely honored that I had two uncles that served as Navajo code talkers in World War II. And thinking about the work that they do really brings to light the, the health, safety, family, community, environment, you name it all in, in one package. Uh, it, the work we do is important. And to all those veterans out there, I, I really wanna express my thanks to you for your service as you played an uh, important role in uh, protecting the, the safety of this country. And with that, I will close my remarks, but I'm open to engaging in discussion with you or answering questions or clarifying some of the points that I made today. Dean, thank I'll you. turn it back to you. I know, thank you so much. And I know that there are going to be a lot of questions. I know that uh, Tania is monitoring uh, the chat window, but I do have a couple of questions for you to lead off with. And one thing I do know from, from talking to you is that your family, like so many others, uh, did experience uh, pretty strong efforts by the US government to assimilate people in the Navajo community into the mainstream community, children taken away from their families, put in boarding schools, taught not to speak the language. I see that your family continued uh, to speak Navajo. You've preserved the language and the culture, which I, I know takes a lot of resilience and strength um, from a family that went through something similar halfway across the world. And um, I, I know how strong those efforts uh, can, can be. But I also know the, the mark that that leaves um, 
on communities in terms of stigma. And given your mission uh, to provide not only for physical health, but also mental and spiritual health, um, how, how you feel that that um, affects the mission of the work that you do, um, that, that, historical, um, that historical trauma that was experienced, but also the stigma that I think is still there um, in those communities. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I appreciate those um, comments and the, the question. Um, certainly everybody's experience is different. I continue to learn about uh, relationships among tribes, uh, not only through the experience of what my family went through, but you know, to give you an example, um, I had an opportunity to go out on the, in, in the state of Alaska, out on the Aleutian chain and um, meeting with some of the island uh, Elliot and Privilof uh, communities where their experience of um, uh, that they went through with, you know, what's known today as Russia, um, as well as um, World War II and some of the relocation on their side, um, even brought in some in-group um, friction between the communities uh, as people. And certainly that plays out in, in tribes with tribes. Um, one thing I, I would mention is that not all tribes are the same. They all have their unique um, historical experiences that they've gone through. But yes, um, addressing these issues from a national perspective is extremely difficult because there's not a one size fits all approach. And really taking um, or learning about the unique uh, experience plays an important role as uh, we build in um, cultural competency trainings for new staff. Um, we found that to be extremely successful um, at the local levels where um, what we call our service units or the, um, the clinics, hospitals, uh, really build in orientation packages and help bring in the community members to give an understanding of what they're um, what they will be involved in and to understand some of the history. Um, but another area that we have focused on, not necessarily in the area of historical trauma, but it is somewhat linked to that, is our tra trauma-informed care um, initiative. This is an initiative where we um, try to uh, develop um, care teams um, they could include behavioral health, the primary care provider, even the dentists who are all coordinating to identify some of these traumas and, and help address them and get the necessary um, care coordination at the, for each patient that they see. So I have a couple of questions coming in, one from Dr. Vicari, and uh, it's an issue that I'm pretty familiar with, but, um, and that is you know, the availability of health data about um, you know um, underrepresented populations and what efforts are made being made you know to make data available and I happen to know that there is a tremendous amount of sensitivity in uh, amongst the, the tribes about um, about availability of data particularly genetic data but really all data and um, that the, just as there's been a lot of movement towards self-determination for running healthcare there also, and running the, for that environmental protection and in other areas, but also IRBs and, and the, um, the importance of involving the communities in those determinations about availability of data. I, I don't know how immersed you are in all of that, but. Um, yeah, I know a little, I know enough to get, to be a little dangerous. So um, <laughs> I would probably defer uh, you to our Office of Public Health Support, but I agree that um, you know, data is extremely important. Um, what we hear from tribal leaders is uh, just sharing their personal um, stories of where some of their communities have had data misused, um, which really um, brings to light the importance of institutional review boards. And at the Indian Health Service, within our Office of Public Health Support, we have a National Institutional Review Board that meets um, monthly. Um, they are willing to assist researchers in navigating the system. One thing I do point out is that tribes also 
uh, may stand up their own um, tribal uh, in IRBs. Um, Navajo Nation, for example, has one. And um, ensuring that there's that coordination uh, for, for data, for research, for, um, for uh, protections um, is key. Uh, one thing that I have observed, or that's, that has been going on at least for the past two years, um, the National Institutes of Health is working on their All of Us study. And um, a number of flags have been raised through, by tribes throughout the country about um, participation. You know, um, even if a member voluntary, voluntarily participates, um, you know, what does that mean for the tribe itself or who becomes owner of that data? So uh, we have been uh, very active in assisting National Institutes of Health um, as they're having tribal consultation to gain input and recommendations from tribes across the country on, on that research. But um, yeah. you know, so my, my guidance would be to, to work through the, the process here. Um, I can share some contacts um, after this webinar if you have specific questions. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Uh, Patricia Pittman, she uh, heads our Mullen Workforce Institute and uh, is, is very involved with health care uh, worker policy, is interested in the challenges with the workforce uh, for health care in IHS, particularly in the context of the uh, COVID pandemic. And if you're able to, um, if you're able to retain health care workers, uh, able to provide um, the cross training to nurses. I'm sure she's also concerned about other issues like PPE. Um, her group did some work on, you know, how to calculate the health workforce needs uh, for intensive care, but also for PPE um, during the pandemic. They have tools that they created. Yeah, absolutely. This, this pandemic, um, nobody's immune to it, um, I'm sure. Everybody on this webinar has either a family member who's experienced or know of somebody that that's been um, impacted directly by the pandemic. Um, for Indian Health Service, this has been extremely challenging for us. Um, it's not uncommon for our patients to have to travel three or four hours to receive health care. So transportation is always a challenge in itself. In addition, um, our patients often live in multi generational homes and are overall a very close-knit community. So large gatherings are a part of life. And so when a highly transmissible infection moves in, it circulates faster. Um, we have made every effort to, um, to build uh, social media campaigns to get uh, messaging out there on the importance of social distancing, uh, but also to do it in a culturally appropriate way and helping to work with um, uh, some of the uh, tribal um, uh, cultural workers, um, some may refer to them as, as medicine men to get some direction in how to message to the communities. Uh, but workforce is critical. Um, in some instances, uh, we've addressed these challenges through a wide range of efforts. Um, for example, the Indian Health Service formed what we call a critical care response team. Uh, this is a team comprised of expert physicians, registered nurses, and other healthcare professionals that provide urgent life-saving medical care as needed, on, uh, needed um, to, to COVID-19 uh, patients. Uh, they also uh, take the opportunity to, pro to, to provide um, critical training to the staff um, that are on hand who may be um, tired, needing a break, um, you name it. Uh, but in all to date, I can say at Indian Health Service in terms of additional supplemental appropriations, we have received over 2.4 billion in new funding to provide resources to our system, which includes our federal IHS sites, our tribal health programs, as well as um, the 41 urban Indian organizations that um, exist throughout the country to prepare for and respond to the coronavirus pandemic. But everybody is in demand. Um, reaching out to federal partners like the VA uh, for, for staff, uh, we're now getting to the point where, um, you know, everybody, the healthcare workforce is, is uh, being exhausted. So definitely a, a huge issue for us. I have a follow-up question about that actually. I'm just thinking about the map you showed us um, earlier and 
particularly the situation with regard to Navajo uh, Nation, which is the Four Corners area that's four different states and probably a number of local jurisdictions as well. And yet, this, but it's a Navajo jurisdiction, clearly. And so it's the public health measures that need to be taken with regard to some, managing something like the pandemic. How does that work, uh, given the presence of you know, multiple, multiple nations, um, uh, you know, across this country. And then the fact that there, you know, there are multiple jurisdictions um, in some of those areas. Um, yeah, you know, absolutely. It's no um, easy endeavor. Um, certainly we respect uh, tribal sovereignty. Um, and so that one goes back to the data. Um, if you visit the, um, our IHS website, ihs.gov, forward slash coronavirus. We've uh, developed a web page that provides um, the data that we do receive through our system. So one, we're guaranteed that that's uh, portraying the information for all our federal sites, but to the extent that tribes that are operating their programs uh, volunteer that data um, to us, it gives us a, a better snapshot of, of where we are in terms of, um, of, of testing uh, to date. Um, what, what does become challenging in, in this instance is um, our posture as a federal government is an all the government approach. So once the emergency declaration was, um, was put in place, you know, it's uh, all hands on deck. What we did see in the Navajo Nation is the nation did stand up to the plate and um, in our posture of setting up what we call an incident command which is to monitor the, the testing, the PP, the personal protective equipment, supplies, um, needs, resources, um, federally. Um, Navajo Nation took a, a posture where they wanted to be at the table jointly with Indian Health Service. And uh, we found this to be extremely um, helpful in those instances of, of um, having a better understanding of the, the, nation, the Navajo Nation-wide um, expectations for communications. Um, where we did see a little bit of challenges are where you do cross states. So um, we do have a number of facilities that reside in um, New Mexico, for example. And if in looking at the map, uh, one of our IHS areas is the Albuquerque area, which encompasses New Mexico. So that did uh, take additional um, coordination and working with um, the state governor um, and others to coordinate uh, response uh, that, that was needed. But certainly we are um, hand in hand partners with the nation. Uh, we communicate with them daily um, and, br and bring uh, urgent issues up the chain even to the White House level when needed. I don't see a question in the box, but I know that many of my faculty are completely um, committed to um, the whole concept of community health centers. Uh, I talked to I talked to um, Ben Smith earlier when when we prepped for this about the fact that we're we're very involved through our Geiger Gibson program and that we've been very uh, strong on promoting the role of community health centers as part of the you know the healthcare uh, safety net. Um, how, how do you work with, with the community health centers um, in, the, where, in, the, in the areas uh, that IHS serves? Absolutely. So um, in terms of community health centers for tribes that are operating their own healthcare programs, um, some of them are community health centers as well. Um, they could be uh, duly funded from Indian Health Service as well as the Health Resources and Services Administration. Um, the location where my father works at, that is one of those locations. Um, but we are very, very, um, we work closely with them and our colleagues over at, at HRSA. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, if you haven't seen it uh, this year, is the publication of the HHS Rural Action Plan. Um, there's a lot of work for community um, health centers in there. and. Um, at least in my work in federal government, this is the first time where I've seen a, an alignment at the administration, congressional 
as well as departmental level of, of um, bringing rural healthcare issues to the forefront. So we're very excited about um, the action plan and uh, some of the things that are identified within it. But that coordination in terms of our Indian health system to community health centers is extremely important. Um, it does uh, bring in uh, themes of care coordination or even the types of services that could be provided. Because uh, in some areas you do have, um, I mean, you're looking at your community as a whole, whether you're native or non-native and tribal leaders take that into um, uh, perspective as they're making their decisions on whether to assume operations from the Indian Health Service uh, to carry them out themselves, where they can provide services to um, others living in their community that may not otherwise meet Indian Health Service yeah. eligibility requirements. Yeah, so we have two additional questions and I'm going to lob them both and let you just uh, conclude with them. and. Um, one of them, well, actually, now there are three. <laughs> um, one has to do with how, in Indian country, the the whole issue of you know the wash facilities, uh, water and sanitation, and and I know the answer, but I'm, I'm going to let you answer it. Um, the second um, has to do um, with the um, you know just kind of thanking you for the commitment of the IHS. Dr. Greenberg from our Department of Epidemiology had worked um, with the IHS. Um, and in his past career at CDC. But to wrap up as well, um, Ben, and I think um, coming from um, Jean Migliaccio, and Jean, by the way, is the person who found you uh, for us, but of interest to him, obviously, is the opportunities for our students uh, to complete their practicums and internships with the IHS, and that's probably a good place to close. Oh, absolutely. So. We welcome you, um, just as myself, when I was uh, doing my grad studies, looking for fellowship opportunities or practicums, I came to the Indian Health Service. But there are a number of um, opportunities here in terms of um, um, internships. So whether you do it here at headquarters or want to do um, some field work, or even um, we have been participating in uh, some of the virtual internships uh, through our various programs. But at Indian Health Service, we do have a scholarship program, um, one that prepares for um, uh, uh, pre-med or other types of um, career paths that are available. These approaching deadlines are gonna be this February for the next academic year. Um, we do have a, a division of oral health externship where um, third year dental students can um, I carry out work at the Indian Health Service through that program. Likewise, that is also um, coming up due in uh, February. But we also have loan repayment. So you, so you choose to um, Indian Health Service as an option down the road and you know, maybe carrying a um, um, student loan debt or whatever it may be. Uh, we do have a, a robust uh, loan repayment program here at Indian Health Service. But we welcome all interest. And it, if you're not a clinician, I'm, I'm not a clinician myself, but we are looking for administrators, um, program uh, directors, or just um, any areas of expertise that you may be interested in. I encourage you to look at usajobs.gov. You can um, bring Indian Health Service to the side uh, or visit our indianhealthservice.gov uh, website where we do have information on the scholarship loan repayment programs and also links to the um, U.S. Commission core opportunities, if that is what you would be interested in. Thank you. And I was just sticking into the chat box a link uh, for the IHS sanitation facilities construction program, but it, it is indeed something that's delegated uh, to the IHS uh, to oh, some yes. extent. Um, even though I, I realize that the environmental agencies also have a role in, in this, but um, this is com the environment is a very complicated thing um, oh, in the new country. Um, yeah, absolutely. Just as we we're talking about addressing some of issues like, like human trafficking, water sanitation issues are one where um, multi federal agencies or departments play a role, and it's important that we work together. So. Our, our team of our Office of Environmental Health and Engineers are 
patched into other federal, federal agencies and worked diligently to uh, bring needed uh, resources as well as um, projects uh, to some of the most remote areas. And the work they do is just outstanding. Well, I have to, I know that all, all of those online are very grateful for this seminar. Uh, we thank you for your service. Um, ben Smith, it's, we're proud to have you as an alum of our university. And uh, I hope that you are able to come back and um, spend some more time with us at, at a later time, maybe even um, when we can get together face to face mm -hmm. again. We'd look forward to seeing you sometime when you're in Washington. Thank you so much uh, for, um, for uh, your generosity and your time and, and all the committed um, people in IHS who you work with. I know that they're doing a lot to make people healthier across our country. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Bye-bye.